Last week, we started at the beginning with the second creation story in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. And we pondered that maybe it was really about the beginning of what it is to be human, to hold that tension of the knowledge of good and evil within us. Because most of the time when I ask people if they would give up knowing what's evil, if it meant they also had to give up knowing what's good, no one wants to take that deal because the good can be so very, very good. But we have a different kind of origin story this week. We're going to move forward in the book of Genesis to the 15th chapter. And we're going to hear about a really important ancestor in faith, Abraham, who at this point in the story is still Abram. They haven't added the ha yet. That happens a little bit later. And his wife at this point in the story is Sarai. And we're going to learn a little bit about him, the father of many faiths. And uh, what you're going to hear, he's actually called in chapter 12, and he steps out, and things don't go exactly as he expects or as he hopes. In fact, some really difficult things happen. And we're going to pick up the story right after that. So my first sentence is, after these things, know that not all of those things were easy or immediately recognizable as good things. So let's jump in in the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. After these things, the Lord appeared to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be great. But Abram said to God, what will you give me, O Lord? For I remain childless, and Eliezer of Damascus will be my heir. He said it again. A servant in my household will inherit everything. The Lord God spoke to Abram again. He is not the one that will inherit. Only your own issue, your own offspring, will be your heir. And then the Lord took Abram outside. And he said, look up at the heavens. Count the stars if you are able. So shall your descendants be. And Abram believed the Lord. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I always feel like I have a lot of things going on, but I very rarely look up. I spend a lot of time looking at just the immediate thing that's right in front of me. Anyone else in this camp? Sometimes I need a reminder to look up. And this week, that reminder came in Bible study as it often does, and it was Pastor Wendy, who does this for me personally as well, but she said, hey, did anyone hear the story about the first civilian to walk in space? Of course I hadn't heard about this because I was only looking at the thing that's in this radius in front of me. So I went and looked, and sure enough, it's true. Jared Isaacman was the first civilian to walk in space. Now, let me be clear, he's no ordinary civilian. It's not like they took someone from the you know, checkout line at Trader Joe's and said, hey, let's put you in space and have you walk. No, he's actually a very skilled pilot. He also happens to be a billionaire. I don't know where that fits into the whole equation. But he did indeed walk in space. My question is, why would you do this? Why would you climb into a capsule that, I don't know, isn't much bigger than our chapel kitchen here at church with other people, climb in there, and then put yourself on top of basically a huge container of rocket fuel, and then ignite it to propel yourself really, really high where there's no oxygen to breathe. Like, why would you do this? And not only that, why would you, once you're up there, leave the relative safety of that capsule to just go out tethered by just a little umbilical cord to walk in space where it's even more dangerous. Why would you do that? I'm thinking that Abram's family and friends felt exactly the same way. 
back in chapter 12 when Abram's like, okay, I got this call from God. And everyone's like, who's God? Because later in the book of Genesis, they call God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No one really knows who God is exactly at this point. And yet Abram is like, we're going to go, we're going to have lots of descendants. And the relatives are like, you're both kind of old, like this may not work out the way that you think, so you're going to leave everything you know, all the rituals and traditions and festivals, you're going to leave all of us on some promise of what? But Abram steps out. You know, the reason Wendy told that story in Bible study was because of what Jared Isaacman said when he took his spacewalk. We've all seen the image of the Earth kind of suspended in space, right? When uh, astronauts look back, and he's silhouetted against it, and you can hear his voice saying, I know we have a lot of problems down there, but from here, it looks perfect. That's what he needed to do, apparently, to get some kind of different perspective on the world. A reminder that this is all a little bit bigger than any of us can completely understand or control or wrap our brains around. And for Abram, it was just the same. He left because of a promise that was bigger than just him, bigger than just what he could imagine or whatever limits may have been placed on him in that time and space. He stepped out with the hope of a promise because, frankly, there wasn't a lot of hope around him otherwise. So they set out, he and Sarai, and let me make clear, they were not unresourced. They had silver and gold and cattle and servants, and they set out and they went to the land they were supposed to go to, and there was a famine there. This is not what Abram expected when he left his life and move to this new place. And so they end up veering over to Egypt where they had enough that they could share. And he tells his wife, Sarai, now you're very beautiful and the Pharaoh is going to want to marry you. So here's my plan. Don't say you're my wife because then Pharaoh will want to kill me and take you as his own wife. So say you're my sister. Does anyone else see where this is going to go? This is not a good plan. And yet Abram goes forward with it, and then it's God that gets Pharaoh's attention and says, ah, uh, she's not his sister. <laughs> she's his wife. And Pharaoh's like, what are you doing to me? So they kick him out of Egypt, and then uh, he gets into trouble because you know that nephew that everyone's got in their family that just kind of hangs on? I don't know. Maybe you don't have that nephew in your family but Lot is coming along with, Lot gets into all kinds of trouble, and Abram, because he has resources, gets him out of trouble, and that's the point where we pick up the story. Things have not been going well for Abram since he took this big step to follow a God that he didn't yet know very well. And God comes to him again, and he's like, hey, still here, I am your shield. Your reward will be great. And for everyone who has ever wondered, is it okay for me to ask God questions? Is it okay for me to challenge God? Here is your permission. What is Abram's response? What are you going to give me, God? I don't even have any children, and you've made this big promise that I'm going to have these descendants. What are you going to give me? When is it going to happen? He challenges God, and God says, come with me. And they go outside, and he looks up at the sky, and he's like, start counting. That's how many descendants you'll have. And you know what? When uh, Abram and Sarai do go on, and they have a son named Isaac, but that's not just the descendants that God is talking about here. It's the heirs of the promise, which goes so far beyond just Abram and Sarai's bloodline and children. It's the heirs of the promise. But then God says one really important thing. Abram believes, and it is credited to Abram as righteousness. 
Now, if you look at Abram's life up to this point, it's like, yes, he did make a big step of faith, but he's made a whole lot of mistakes where he just kind of took things into his own hands. And I'll give you a little preview. It's going to keep happening. In fact, the very same thing happens when he goes to Egypt the next time. Yes, the very same thing. He's like, no, 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 she's my sister. Yes, it happens again. God doesn't reckon Abram's belief is righteousness because Abram's so amazing, but because God is. So on the checkbox where it says, Abram, righteous, not righteous, God has already checked righteous. And God checked it in Sharpie. You are not going to get rid of that, Mark. It's going to be there because of who God is. And for we who are also heirs of the promise, and we know a whole lot more than Abram did. In fact, we know a whole lot more about Jesus. We have also had that box checked for us. Righteous, in Sharpie. You're not going to get rid of it. Our calling, like Abram's, is to live out of what God has already given us to step out boldly, and to occasionally look up. And remember, it's so much bigger than any of us. In Jesus' name, amen.